Hello everyone, welcome to the basement. I hope you, uh, yeah, you managed to get all the way down here without too much inconvenience. Um, the talk today is called Monitor My Socks and um, it's a bit of a play on words. Uh, hopefully what I'm going to talk about is um, a lot of the Prometheus talks talk about like a specific um, implementing Prometheus in a specific way, like a specific language or a specific tool or something like that. I'm trying to broaden the scope a little bit and I'm not just about languages, I'm also going to talk about how you actually deploy it as well. Um, but the slot is only 30 minutes, so I'm going to race through it at a pace of, of knots. Um, my name is Phil Winder, I'm a freelance engineer. Um, my company is called Winder Research, but I've been mainly working with container solutions and WeWorks. So, how did, how did we start? Well, Container Solutions was asked to help out WeWorks develop one of their new products, or a few of their new products. Um, and this product is called Weave Cloud, and it's a, uh, a hosted service to help visualize, and monitor, and um, uh, integrate with your CI pipeline. So we were asked to help out with this, and specifically for, uh, for this conference, part of that service is uh, a service called Cortex. And effectively, it's a, a hosted, managed, multi-tenant version of Prometheus. And it's really cool because, well, one of the biggest features is that it's backed by Amazon S3, so you could, you've pretty much got unlimited data retention, so you don't have to drop data any time. That's one of the big features there. But we're also adding um, lots of added extras that hope to improve the user experience as well. But whilst we were doing all of these projects, we, we started to realize that we, need, A, needed something to test as part of our development life cycle, uh, and B, we needed something we can demo. And so we started asking around, you know, well, what can I demo, what can I show? And, you know, we started asking even more basic questions, more basic questions, like how do you do microservices? And there's loads of great literature around, there's loads of great, great blog posts and books and stuff that have been published. But there weren't really any realistic examples that you could just get up to speed with straight away. So with that given, what we decided to do was invent the Sock Shop. And the Sock Shop is an open source reference microservices architecture. And what, we're, what I'm hoping today is that I'm going to just take, take you through a brief tour of, of, some, of its, uh, some of its implementation. But the, the beauty is that you can go away right now and deploy this yourself and look at the code yourself. And it's a, a fully working application. The idea is that it's supposed to replicate an e-commerce website. And um, the, the way that it's laid out is supposed to be more realistic than some of the, you know, the examples that you see in blog posts and, and things like that. The, the actual layout of the, the example looks a bit like this. Each of these circle, circles is a, is a service, and these services are backed by certain databases, and we've got a few other technologies in there, like queues and stuff as well. Um, the front end is serving a dual purpose. It's, like a, it's, it's hosting the static content, the website stuff, and it's also acting as like an API gateway to the rest of the services as well. The rest of the services represent different parts of the imaginary sock shop. So we've got a cart catalog and an order processing line, things like that. And we intentionally made it polyglot. So one of the decisions really early on was to use as many languages, languages as we could. And that was so that when new people came to the project or wanted to try the project, they'd be able to um, uh, um, use their own background to, to, to get interested in the project with uh, a specific service that they were interested in. Um, so we've got services written in Go, we've got services written in Java, and we've got a service written in Node.js as well. So hopefully it's covering both front end and back end guys. We're also using a, a range of different supporting technologies and databases as well. And so this is it. So I'm going to skip to the live version, hopefully. So, yeah, it's working fine. So I'm just going to take you on a very, very brief tour of what it is. So we've got a catalog here that we can view. We can add our items to the cart. We've got like a user service where we can log in. Okay, password was just password, if you were wondering. And then we can proceed to check out the place in order. And so that, in a very short sequence of steps, kind of exercised all of the different services that are going on um, in the background. And <laughs> Later on, I'll show you some of the monitoring that are included in those services so we can see this process in, in action. And you can see how many times I've practiced this presentation by the number of orders I've got there. 
And this is the link. I'll put this up at the end. But hopefully you can go away today and try it for yourself. And let us know what you think. And um, yeah, have a search around. It's, uh, there's a short link, git.io stock shop. Or if you just search for microservices demo, you'll get there. And you'll find this website. And one of the coolest things about the project is that we, intend, we, we initially developed the project to test various components against different deployments. So even though this is a Kubernetes conference, you know, if you're interested in Mesos or Nomad or, or any of the Docker uh, you know, products, then you can actually deploy the sock shop to any of those different deployments. So it's like a like-for-like a -like comparison using the same, the same service. Okay, so onto the meat course. So I'm going to actually delve a little bit into the code. Can I just ask who was here for the previous talk who the, to talk about Java? Ah, okay, not that many. I will, okay, so he went into detail how to do this in Java. He went over all the uh, J, J, JVM metrics and stuff like that, but I'll just, I'll cover my bit um, again because I think people will, will benefit from it. So the Prometheus libraries, uh, there are several officially supported Prometheus libraries, Go, Java, Scala, Python, Ruby. There's also lots of unofficial ones, which from what I've seen are generally of good quality as well. Uh, we use the Node.js one in, in our application, and that's, that's solid. So I wouldn't worry too much about using a third-party library. Some of the libraries have helper frameworks. So if you're specifically, if you're using something like Java, then you might, I would double check the, um, the the Prometheus project itself and other people as well, because generally people have already done what you're trying to do. Like if you're trying to get like export JVM metrics, for example, there's already exporters out there, so, so don't try and rewrite that yourself. There's helpers for, uh, for, for Spring and, and Jetty and then things like Hibernate, which will automatically export Hibernate-related metrics and Log4j and stuff like that. But first, because this is a bit more of a Go-friendly conference than Java, then we're gonna, we're gonna look at Go first. The, Project has three Go services. The payment, user, and catalog services are all written in Go. And the one I'm going to look at right now is the catalog, because it's one of the simplest. It's backed by a database, a MySQL database, that stores the data. Uh, I'm going to look a little bit at the code now. So this is the first time you might be seeing a met. So actually, that's a good question. How many, he how many people here have actually defined a metric before? Do you, do you, do you understand what metrics? About half, about half, okay. So I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna take it a little bit slow over this first definition, but then I'll, I'll be faster on the next ones because they're all very similar. So here we're defining a global variable called HTTP latency, and we're using the standard Prometheus library to create a new histogram. And before we go any further, this is probably one of the most important bits. So Prometheus supports four types of symmetrics, a counter, a gauge, a summary, and a histogram. So a counter is a simple count of things. A gauge is like a, a real-time view of a measurement. A summary is like a summary statistic. And um, a histogram is a histogram of values. So it's like a, you know, is it like a histogram chart? So it counts in individual bins. We've chosen histogram because of a chap called Tom Wilkie down in this corner here. He, he um, upset a few people by trying to define his own better metric scheme, and it came up with this nice acronym, Red Metrics. And um, the idea there is that with Red Metrics, you can generally monitor the, the things that are, are most important to your application. And they are the request rate, the error rate, and the duration of that call that's happening. So the request rate is a count, the error rate is the count of the number of errors, and the duration, the latency, can be measured by a histogram bucket. You don't want to use a summary statistic like a, a rolling average there because it doesn't represent outliers very well. It doesn't represent the range very well. And the beauty about the histogram vector is, uh, is that the, you, can count, you can obtain all of these metrics just with the one single histogram metric. So you, with the histogram metric, you get a count for free, and you can do the error rate with labels, and you also get the, the buckets, obviously, as well. So all of the services that I'm about to show you all are implemented with a histogram. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way. The next most important thing is the name. Um, there's some good documentation on the Prometheus website, and there's also some good blog posts uh, that tell you how to pick good names for your, label, uh, for your names. 
And the reason for doing that is because it's not you, the developer, that will be using these metrics. It's going to be other people as well. It's going to be other developers, other ops guys, it could be marketing people, stuff like that. So you need a good name that explains what the variable is and they, so they can find it easily. Um, and so generally, I kind of summarize all of the recommendations into two things. One is to use SI units, so seconds, bytes, um, meters, grams, stuff like that. And, uh, and, and secondly, be consistent in your naming. So if, you've got, if you are measuring the same type of thing, like we are going to be here, we're measuring a HTTP call, be consistent in what you call it. I'm, it doesn't matter so much what you call it. Well, I mean, it does, but I could have called it like HTTP request duration or something. But it's more important to be consistent with whatever you do choose because then it becomes much easier to do some more advanced querying and filtering on the, on the final metrics when you get them. Um, a little bit help, skip that bit. Buckets is quite important depending on what you're doing. So um, the histogram I said is, is a count in particular bins and you actually have to define those bin ranges in advance. So by default, it gives you, uh, I can't remember, I think it's like 10, 10 bins ranging from one millisecond up to 10 seconds. If you're trying to monitor something that's outside of that range or you know, is significantly skewed to one side of that range, then you'd want to override that and provide your own bin, uh, bin sizes. And the second most important thing is the labels, because with the labels, this allows us to do this. So with this little bit of code, I'm defining four labels here. The first one is the method. So this is related to HTTP. Uh, <laughs> metric so the method is like get post put delete we've got the root which is the path to the HTTP resource that we're accessing and then we've got a status code so with the request rate we can just look at the method and root for the error rate we can look at the method and the root but filter for particular status codes that's what gives us our error definition and finally we can get the, the, the duration from the, the histogram itself and that's it really so once you've defined your metric, you need to register that metric. And you might have noticed that I said use a global variable. And we generally use global variables because by definition, Prometheus dictates that uh, you're not allowed to have duplicate metric names because you can only have one metric for one name. So by definition, you might as well make it global and, and ensure that. Because I've, I've found like during tests and things like that, if you don't make them global, sometimes they can get instantiated twice and you'll get a nasty stack trace. Okay, we've got a quick middleware definition here, so we can intercept the HTTP call. And then we're creating something called an instrument here. And in this instrument, we've got our metric that we're going to use to write our metric. And then we've got another thing which is quite important called a, a, a root matcher. And generally the goal of this piece of code is to try and match uh, roots to their defined that we've provided. So if I give you an example on the catalog, usually we're accessing the catalog with something like a, a path of like slash catalog slash ID to get a particular item in that catalog. We don't want to create a new metric for every single ID because we could end up with thousands or millions of metrics. And that's a, a very quick way to degrade the performance of your Prometheus. So what we do is we match that route to a predefined name. So It'll probably look like um, it'll either be given a name if you're using like Gorilla Mux or something, but in other languages we maybe just replace the ID with a fixed string, like colon ID or something like that. And then we've finally got the thing that does the monitoring. And it, it's a bit long, but it's actually quite simple. We've got a bit in the middle here, this serve HTTP. This is, this is actually calling the method um, that actually performs whatever the endpoint is doing, it actually does what the endpoint is doing. And then we've got like pre and post code. In the pre code, we're starting a timer. In the post code, we're calculating the geo. And then there's a few other bits around it. And then the last line here, we're actually doing the writing of that metric that we've just measured. Um, we're passing in the method, the root, the status call, and a WebSocket thing that we don't worry about. But um, these two things are calculated from the, the code above. And then we're, we're writing to the metric with the observe method. Uh, and passing in the number of seconds that it took. 
And that's, that's kind of it, really. This is just a bit of wiring to, to, to pull that all together. Um, this is kind of general sort of standard Go code. Go code. We've got our endpoints for our particular services. We're creating our router to handle the HTTP calls. We've got, um, we're defining the middleware in this instrument thing that I told you about. So this is where we're passing in our metric, our global metric, and that's creating the middleware. And you can have you know, more middlewares and loggers and stuff like that. We're merging them all together and wrapping them around the router. And that's it. We go. So let's have a look at something else now. Look at some Java code. Um, and I will go through this despite the, the previous talk, which is more like more in-depth uh, uh, Java metrics and monitoring. So if you're interested in Java specifically, take a look at Alexander's talk before me. Um, in the, the Microsoft demo, there are three Java services again. And we're going to look at the cart. I say, just a digression slightly, just to vent my anger. I say J for Java because my, I've, got, I've got a young daughter, two young daughters, and the eldest, she was really into looking at these flashcards. And on the flashcard, they had J for jellyfish. And so I had a massive argument with my, my wife, like, like why, why J for jellyfish? She's two years old, she lives in England, she's never ever gonna see a jellyfish until she goes to the aquarium when she's 10. So why not J for jellyfish, J for jar, something different? So I took methods into my own hands and now J is for Java. So if you ask my daughter now, J is for Java. <laughs> so if she becomes an NGO later on, I, I'm blaming this. This is, this is where it all started. Um, within the Java services, we chose to use Spring Boot. Um, we did this because it made it very easy to get up and running um, and make a microservices in a very short amount of time. Some of you use it, great. Some of you love it. Some of you hate it for various reasons. Um, generally, Spring Boot is all controlled by uh, like aspect oriented programming stuff, so it's all like annotations. Um, but if you're just using core Java or something else like Java EE or something, most of this, these things can be done by extending classes rather than uh, using annotations. But we start really simply because we're using the Spring Boot helper that comes with the Prometheus library. And it comes with enable Prometheus endpoint. And that single line will handle all the back end stuff to expose the, slash, the, the, the metrics endpoint and set up all of the, the Prometheus registers and stuff. So, very nice. Little, little caveat though. By default, Spring Boot comes with something called Actuator. Actuator is a, a Spring Booty thing to expose loads of metrics. Uh, and I've got a little bit of code to disable that because it exposes on slash metrics by default. And I'm changing the Prometheus uh, endpoint to be slash metrics. So I'm basically just replacing that. So there's a couple of options for doing the timing. The easiest one is to use another annotation. There's a Prometheus time method, and that's great. However, this by default uses a summary type. Um, a summary type is something that I haven't gone into detail, but basically it's, an, it's a, a summary statistic. It's a, a rolling average measurement. You can provide um, quantiles to compute on those values. But the problem is that if you had multiple services and tried to, you, if you had multiple services, you can't aggregate a summary type because those quantiles have already been calculated. So that's bad. And also, it's, they're not very flexible if you change your mind. If you don't want to measure the 99th percentile, you want to change it to 98th or something. Um, so I wouldn't use that method. If I were you, what I would probably do is write your own annotation to do what you want, probably with a histogram if you're doing this type of stuff. Um, and I'm surprised it's not in the library, and it probably will be soon, to be honest. And you can see I've been very helpful and provided you with all the code that you need to do that. But what I did was uh, I went with convention with the other services, and I wanted to monitor all of the endpoints. So I did some spring jiggery pokery to insert some interceptors, which are like, like middleware, basically. And um, I added my interceptor to a particular route, which was just all route, just a glob there. Now we come to the actual definition of the histogram, and you'll notice that it's very, very, very similar to the Go implementation. And you'll find that all of the libraries follow the same pattern. You know, you create a new thing, and you're passing it names and, and, and label names and stuff like that. All very, very similar. Um, the interceptor that I'm creating has has got a pre-handle, like a pre-hook, and it's got a post-handle, post-hook. And this is doing the same thing as the Go code is doing, where we're starting, the, uh, starting a timer in the pre-hook, and then we're 
calculate the duration in the post hook. Pretty nice. So I would probably recommend that you just write your own annotation, though, especially if you're using Spring or Spring Boot. Um, create an, an annotation that would create a histogram with your specific options. Um, and that's probably easier to use in the long run. Final one is Node.js and Express. And that's the front end, obviously. Race through this one. We're using Express, uh, the Express framework, and the Prom Client library, which is one of the unofficial libraries, but it's very, very similar to the others. We're creating a global, global variable called the request duration seconds again, same name. Um, it's got the same labels. Yeah, pretty, pretty similar. Express has got a, a middleware concept, and this is implementing that, that middleware interface. And same thing again, um, we're starting a timer, calculating the duration there, and then writing it. Expose the metrics function at the end. Very similar. And that's all well and good. And now you've got the code. But what I've seen previously is that not many people talk about deploying that. And since this is a bit, this is a, this is a Kubernetes conference, I thought I would try and show you deploy that a little bit. Uh, OK, so I'm running out of time. Normally, when you finish your code, you get some sort of meme in Git like this or in Slack. And this is my entire meme quota in one slide, by the way. Um, you t people say, great, you've done the code, now ship it. And, it. and it's actually not that simple. I would say that, that writing the, uh, uh, the manifest, the Kubernetes manifest, and getting it all set up and set up in the right way can actually be as difficult, if not more difficult, than writing the code itself. So I'm going to take a look, quick look at that. Remember that we can deploy to other orchestrators, but I think someone would probably get pissed off if I started talking about Mesos or something. So <laughs> I'll stick to Kubernetes. Um, I assume you're all fairly familiar with manifests. If you're not, just go to the repo. Well, in fact, you can go to the repo irrespective of your experience and, and look at all of these in detail. Um, but basically, we're creating manifests um, that contain the Prometheus image, passing all of the arguments to the Prometheus binary. And the configuration file is being passed in by a volume mount. And the volume mount, the Prometheus.yaml, is actually a uh, config map. And inside the config map, we have all of the Prometheus scrape settings. And this, this is really where the, the chunk of the work is to get Prometheus set up how you want it to get set up. Um, the one in the repository, this one, is just the same as the example that Prometheus give you to, to monitor Kubernetes. Works really well out of the box. Um, if you wanted to do something more advanced, that's where you'd start. And then finally, we've got a, a service, Prometheus um, service that's exporting a, a port for us. You can try this out yourself with Minikube, and it's as simple as doing that, and you'll have a, a, full, a fully deployed setup. Um, basically, start Minikube. I'd recommend upping the memory. There's a lot of services there. Um, there's, there's sort of eight to 10 services, and plus all the Kubernetes stuff as well. I'd up it to, to four gigs of RAM if you can. And then clone that repository, do a kubectl create on the um, complete demo file, and then a kubectl create on the manifest monitoring folder, and then wait, because it takes a while to download all of that. And then, if the demo gods are smiling down on me, you will get something that looks like that. Yay. So this is a, a, a version of the same thing that's running in the cloud. Um, not on my laptop because it would grind to a halt. But you can see we've got lots of different namespaces there. We've got specific namespaces for the, the sock shop. Um, we've also got the namespace for the monitoring, and that's where the Prometheus deployment has been deployed. Um, interestingly, someone's booked the number of front ends. I, was that you? Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> um, and if we, uh, I've got a, an SSH uh, tunnel open and it's forward in Prometheus for me. And if we were to type in <coughs> duration seconds, oh, where did that go? Count. Then we should see our variables there. There you go. So all of those services are now being scraped automatically by the, the Prometheus configuration. Um, and all of the services are exporting metrics on slash metrics. Awesome. 
So once you've got Prometheus deployed, what do you do next? The next thing to do is to start thinking about uh, what you would like to do as an engineer or as a business. Um, but we, we've, we've gone through some examples with the sock shop here. So the first one is Grafana. So Grafana um, is a, a, a dashboarding tool. Often comes with Prometheus and it's, it's very cool. I won't go through all the details, but you can have a look in the repo. Um, basically, we've got the Grafana dependency and service, like just like we did for Prometheus. And the coolest bit is that we've got one massive, massive config map with the JSON Grafana dashboards inside. So all of the dashboards are stored in Git, in you know version controlled, and um, they get pulled in and then written to uh, Grafana when it starts. There's a little batch job to ingest and write the dashboards to the, the configuration file. And then there's a few extra bits to get some more information about Kubernetes and disk usage and stuff. And that is what it looks like. Let me see if the live version is running. <coughs> Ooh, almost. So that doesn't look great. Um, but here we go. So this is a live dashboard of, of what's going on at the moment, or it would be a live dashboard if we can see some metrics. Come on. <sighs> Ah, oh, damn you, Wi-Fi. <laughs> I might have to go back to the picture backups then. Oh, oh. It's getting there. Ah, too slow, too slow, too slow, too slow. OK, but we've got dashboards for performance. Ironically, we've got dashboards for performance. Um, we've got default dashboards for the error rate. Uh, the request rate, the latency of the service, uh, and, and, and things like that, and, and error rates and stuff. So that's very cool. Uh, there's a dashboard specific to the sock shop resources. There's also Kubernetes resources as well, uh, just monitoring CPU usage and RAM usage and, and things like that. Uh, and then we've got a very simple analytics kind of dashboard. Uh, let me see if we can get that up, actually, because that's a bit of a smaller dashboard to load. And then we can see how many Socks we've sold. 37,000 orders have been placed since this, start, this, this example started running. So hopefully I'll be a rich man when this presentation ends. Once you've got the monitoring in place, the next step is alerting. And alerting with Prometheus is done by a little side project called Alert Manager. Um, what happens is Prometheus sends its alerts, which could come from multiple sources, into an alert manager. And an alert manager handles all of the deduplication and all of the aggregation and then spurts an alert out to one of many services. So again, we've got manifests in that repository that define the alert manager dependency. Um, and again, we're using a volume mount to pass in the settings file for uh, the alert manager. And inside the settings file, you've got lots of things like your uh, Slack secret and, and all of the other options um, and which define how you want Alert Manager to alert. And in this case, we have a, a, a Kubernetes secret set up called the Slack hook URL, and that's being written by this little script into, into the configuration file. You also have another config map which defines your alert rules, and in this case, this is an example alert rule for a high error rate. So if we've got... Um, if you look, that's our metric that we defined in our code. If we've got a status code of 500 for any of those services, of greater than one for five minutes, then we're going to get an alert in Slack. And I'm not going to try and do that because the Wi-Fi will fail on me, I, I suspect. But what it looks like is that. So that's a, a very noddy example, but you know, in, in actual usage, we've got alerts for all sorts of different things. Um, or any, any, anything from service health all the way down to performance and you know, user metrics and stuff like that. Um, so to summarize, what I would say is go and check out this project on those URLs. Um, try and deploy it yourself, have a play about with it, break it, fix it. Um, if you like it and want to contribute back, then just again, it's on the repo. Check out Weave Cloud, and specifically the Cortex part of Weave Cloud. Uh, it's a really cool um, and a, a you know, well-developed, sophisticated version of Prometheus, which is multi-tenant multi and, and, and hosted. Um, there's improvement all the time as well. I've been Phil Yeah, Thank you very much.
Any questions, please? Sure, yeah. Um, so, firstly, I think, um, and I'm with your wife, I think jellyfish is way better than jelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second thing would be, um, how do you feel about things like liquidity that intercepted before it actually would have to make contact? I. I couldn't comment on that, I'm afraid. I haven't got enough experience with Linkerd to, to comment. Um, there's probably better people that, are, that can answer that question. So I would forward you to some of my colleagues that were better able to <laughs> answer that question. So yeah, see me afterwards and I'll point you in the, in the right direction if you're interested in knowing the, the answer to that. Anyone else? Yeah. Is there a uh, resource for the device? Uh -huh. We were just mentioning uh, it's easy to find them, but yeah. they have like a best practice somewhere. Um, well, check out the Alert Manager project. I mean, that's where all the documentation is. But as you can see, it's actually remarkably simple. It's just got a, a simple syntax specifying alerts. You've got if a Prometheus yeah, query. The, the, okay. The, the, it was more like having somebody else to talk about uh, what's best practice, which alerts are noisy, which are not. There's like a certain, like templates of the um, alerting contracts. Yeah, I, I think, I, I can't personally, not in, not in this talk, because it's, it's not a talk about Alert Manager. I have seen other, there, there are other talks about Alert Manager in, in particular, which you could probably get more detailed information there. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, it's going to be down to you eventually. I'm sure there's, there's patterns you can copy, but, it, you know, everybody's alert is different for everybody everybody's business you might be more important in um, you might be more interested in uh, certain things that other people have for example so again sorry <laughs> useless why would you specifically choose Prometheus for this kind of stuff? ask the Prometheus developers <laughs> next <laughs> I mean personally personally I would choose it because um, it's super simple, and I love that. You know, all of the other, especially the proprietary systems, are very complex and they're hard to understand, and therefore hard to use and hard to deploy and hard to manage. Prometheus, uh, in in complete comparison, in uh, in complete opposite of that, is is super simple. Um, everything is well described, and it's basically very hard to get wrong, and it does the job. So that's all I can ask of a monitoring tool. <laughs> So when you monitor, you're monitoring like endpoints, like things coming in. But what about the things you send out, like requests you do out? Do you monitor for that? Yeah, yeah, sure. You can just yeah monitor all all activity yeah, and more. Some, have you examples of this? And this uh, no, all all of the examples in the SOC shop are all incoming. Um, the only the only real. The, the more complex example we've got in there is that we've got like an orders pipeline. So you've got one service that calls another, that calls another, that calls another. Yeah. So all of those do report metrics, and then the, the top level one, the, the orders one, is kind of an aggregation of all of those. Yeah, yeah. That's the most complicated situation we've got in there. But yeah, yeah, I can imagine that you would like to measure things going well, out as well. Well, for instance, if you say you monitor on the incoming side, but also on the upcoming side, you can kind of compare it. Right. See if there's a problem in between. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Because you, you never know where the problem is. Right? Yeah. Coming right. network, coming anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rome. <laughs>